All righty, we're back for another episode. Today, I'm joined by Professor Thomas Teets here at the University of Houston, who is an associate professor in our inorganic division. Uh, a couple of things first is, you know, you have like 2,000 subscribers on YouTube for like your your content for your classes. Oh. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> It's quite it's quite impressive trying to work towards uh, that kind of content. <laughs> I don't know when you, when yeah, did you they, make those videos. Was that for uh, like COVID or? No, I started before that. So I I started that channel I think in 2016. I mean, I've been teaching general chemistry most of my time here, um, and some students sort of suggest that might be helpful. And so I kind of started small, and then it kind of grew from where it is. And yeah, a lot of students that are you know, not even taking the course in my section, use those because the, the course is pretty uniform for the whole department. So they still find some use in those. Um, I don't know why so many people subscribe. They seem to subscribe and then never go away because they only take the class for one <laughs> semester. You'd think they would just kind of <laughs> drop out after that, but. Who knows? I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's quite a staggering number. So I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting actually. <laughs> but well, yeah, um, I mean, we have, we have about 2000 students a year that take that class or at least yeah. it's, you know, 1500 or so. So it's a big, so I, I guess it makes sense over the years, but the other, yeah. the other thing is too, I was, I was on your website and, uh, I, this, your tagline of good science that's guaranteed. <laughs> All right. That is genius. Did you come up with that or is some, some students? Yeah. Somehow, somehow the guaranteed pun kind of started in graduate school. I don't remember <laughs> if it was, if it was me or someone in the other lab, you know, someone else in the lab that came up with it. Um, and I figure, you know, it's, it's, a lot of science is about branding, right? It's not about necessarily yeah. the quality of the work. So that was that was our <laughs> brand name, our, our trademark. Uh, that's 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 excellent. Um, but yeah, so I guess we'll hop into it a little bit. So yeah, so you actually did your undergrad um, at Case Western. Uh, did you? Are you from the Midwest, like Ohio area, or yeah? Um, you so I, I'm from, from a um, from a small town about 25 miles west of Cleveland, uh, okay. called Amherst. Our Population is around, I think, twelve thousand, and our our claim to fame is the sandstone center of the world. I used to be like, <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but <laughs> so sandstone's a you know a, sort of a, a gritty stone material that used to be used for for building and sidewalks and things. And we had a couple huge quarries in the in the area, and you know, the businesses run out of there. Yeah, okay. so that's what we did. Um, that's that's guess, long gone though. They're they're before, just filled with water at this point. Oh, uh, are they? Before yeah. going to uh, Case Western, like growing up, uh, um, you know, we were always kind of interested in STEM. And do you have any hobbies also in activities growing up that you still continue to today? Yeah, the one thing that I continue to today is is, um, is piano. So I've been mm. studying pretty seriously. I started studying fairly seriously around eight years old and um, kept it up, you know, formal studies through college. And, and now it's essentially a hobby. I mean, I, you know, I used to have up until graduate school, I was still doing occasional like paid gigs and things, not really enough to make a living, obviously, but, you know, just kind of a side job sort of thing. And now it's just, you know, purely a hobby, but I still keep up with it as much as I can. That sounds super like interesting. What kind of gigs, like, did you do gigs when you were in high school and like as an undergrad? Yeah, mostly then. So okay. mostly, mostly accompaniment. So, you know, for, or, or you know, events kind of like, you know, professional dinner events or weddings okay. or things like that. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't all that frequent. I didn't, you know, work that hard to find things, but when things came up, I would do them and it was a fun little side job for a while. I could just imagine like you as an undergrad getting hired in the, I'm sure there's like a good, like, cause obviously Cleveland has good music taste and like there's a good music culture there. So I can imagine like you getting hired at like a, a bar somewhere and you're playing like jazz like or not jazz but uh, you know that kind of music for <laughs> yeah oh jazz was one thing i didn't do but you know mo mostly yeah mostly like weddings and dinner parties kind of things okay. more more low-key not like that's the, fair what kind the of music jack jazz <laughs> <laughs> what kind of uh i mean can you ver i mean you've been doing it for godness how long now so i imagine you can pick up any like genre music but um any like particular like favorites of yours I mean, I mostly, I mostly trained on classical. And so, okay. um, you know, I have my favorite composers. I've always enjoyed, um, Mendelssohn, uh, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, obviously are, are amazing to play. Um, so that's what I, I trained on. Um, my wife really likes, you know, new age piano music, which is mm. not as technically challenging, but still fun to play. And so I play a lot of that now for, for fun and, um, 
you know, like I said, a lot of the performance things I did were vocal accompaniment for either like musical theater or just like cabaret type shows. So it was mm -hmm. a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay. One other question about that is like, because I've never really played an instrument, but for the piano, is it kind of easy to, let's say, switch between genres? Like, could you just pick up like some piano notes and like start playing or is it not really that easy? For the most part, yes. So the I one thing I really appreciate from the um from the teacher that I had growing up from like, you know, eight years old through high school, um he's not like a virtuoso piano player. He kinda does a lot of the same things that I talked about, you know, accompaniment and, and kind of stuff like that. And but one thing he really taught was um how to how to sort of sight read, how to improvise a little bit, how to use just like the the chord progressions to really, you know, piece together the accompaniment. Mm. So that was always nice because a lot of times when you're doing, you know, accompaniment type gigs, you don't have, you know, a lot of rehearsal time. You kind of just have to step in and play the music and, you know, being able to, to to read it and being able to sort of quickly piece together what you're supposed to do without having to, you know, pour over each, every individual note is, is really useful. So for most part, that's true. The one, the one genre I have little experience with, um, and that's, it's kind of a whole different ball game in some respects is jazz. Um, so you made the, you know, you made the joke yeah. about jazz earlier, but that's like the one Fair. thing I don't do. Um, I did do, a, I did play in a jazz band once for just a volunteer thing for an event on campus as an undergrad. There was a, I was a TA for a class and one of the students in the class was, um, they had this like Israeli jazz band. Um, it was a bunch, <laughs> it was like, you know, Israeli students and they, um, they wanted, they needed someone to fill in as piano player for, you know, one little event they had. And so. I did it. I faked it. You know, it wasn't great, yeah. but it was still fun to try. That's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's incredible. I guess a good segue then into uh, your time at Case. Oh, actually, uh, let me go back for a minute. So, like STEM in general, uh, growing up, was that something that was always interested in you, or you kind of didn't really pick it up until, um, like going to college? Yeah, for case yeah. My my parents are more have more of a STEM background, I suppose. They well, they. They're in information technology, you know, computer programming, mm -hmm. which they were able to get into before it even required, you know, college education to do. But that was kind of their career. And so we always were math and science people for the most part. The one thing that, you know, as a kid that I was pretty obsessed with, along with my twin brother, we have, I have a twin growing up. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah. So we, we were just obsessed with animals. I mean, we would, you know, six years old, we'd go to the library with, with you know, our family on a weekly basis in the summer, especially. And, you know, check out every book they had on animals and just read them cover to cover. And we got these, this subscription called Zoo Books. I don't even know if this exists anymore. I listen. I, I remember seeing those commercials as a kid. The Zoo Books. I know exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So we we would get those and you know, excited to read them every time they came. And so we were, you know, we were obsessed with animals. We'd go to the zoo on a regular basis, and you know, probably explain to people at the zoo what everything was when they were saying things wrong. You know, they they would. <laughs> you know, at six years old, we're doing that kind of stuff. So it was, that was always <laughs> our big thing. Um, that was always our, yeah. And, and so we, in, you know, my brother never really lost that animal itch. He actually is an entomology professor now studying insects. So he's oh, wow. still in the, he's still in the animal world. I kind of <laughs> veered out of that and it was, you know, in, in high school, I think just the, the chemistry classes really clicked for me. Um, I had good teachers, maybe not amazing teachers but good yeah um and and you know we were really just something that i think the connection between you know the molecular world and the macroscopic world was always fascinating and the more you you know the more you dug into that and the more you also realize as you especially as you get into research later on that you know the ability to be creative in chemistry is something that you don't always have in other fields of study for sure um is your brother identical or is it uh he's identical, identical to yeah most of the Surely, times he keeps, he keeps no, his ahead, hair shorter most of the time. So there's, okay. there's an easy distinguishing feature between us, but we I look pretty similar. I was going to say, Shirley, you've, have you ever tried switching um, like throughout high school or middle school? Like has that uh, ever our, came I our, I think our second, I think our second grade teacher put us up to that. <laughs> um, in high school, we had most of our, we had most of our classes together in high school because we okay. took you know, yeah, the, same class. all the advanced sequence. It was kind of a smaller school, not a huge school, so they didn't have a lot of offerings. So, all right, all right. So, because you were obsessed with animals growing up, I mean, do you have like a few animals, like few of your favorite animals that you have? 
near and dear to your heart? Um, we kind of, I mean, we, we certainly funneled into reptiles and amphibians. So we, mm. we had a, we had an enclosure at one point where we kept those little terrarium, I guess you would call it, or not even yep. a terrarium. It's like, it was, it was a kind of a half filled tank that, you know, had water and it had land. So kind of like a, I forget what we call that now. I'm blanking on the terminology, but, uh, we had, you know, turtles and salamanders and frogs and stuff in there. That was kind of our favorite thing to sort of raise at home and, and keep up That's with. That's really but cool. We, yeah, we sort of were into everything and I hear that. Yeah, I, I uh I don't know I don't know how much of a hot take this is, but like um if you could domesticate any animal and kind of keep it as a pet, what animal would you choose? I think I would choose a wolf, but that's pretty close wolf. to a dog, honestly, but you know. Or a bear. Yeah. I mean, that's just, just kidding, we've, a bear. We've, well, we've, we've, maybe not in a widespread sense, we've probably domesticated almost everything you can think of at this point. Um, I think birds of prey are fun. I mean, they have been domesticated, obviously. That's not like a, mm. one, that, you know, the unique one, but I think those would be, I've always been fascinated by those too. Okay. That's fair. Okay. All right. So, that's, yeah, that's, that's really um, interesting. Okay. So, moving to Coast Western. Um, was it was it an easy choice to go to Case Western because obviously you're from the area, so it was kind of like, I mean, Case Western is a great STEM school too. I know a lot of people went there for like biochemistry, in particular. Yeah, but it's uh, it was a pretty easy choice. I didn't, you know, maybe at, at that time, you know, things were also a little bit different. It's gotten more ridiculous now. But I didn't I didn't apply for, you know, twenty schools that people do these days. I, was, I applied to three. Um, got into two of them and, and Case gave me a really generous scholarship offer too, on top of it being, I think, a really good fit for what I wanted to do. Um, and I was, you know, it was the first time I lived in a city. I know Cleveland's not a huge city, but it's a city, right? Compared to a small town that I grew up in. And I was sure. interested in, in experiencing that environment too. So that was a, a bit of a draw to the other school that I was admitted to was kind of, you know, more middle of nowhere, I guess you would say. Um, and, and, you know, Case was in the city. Um, you know, I, at the time I knew I wanted to do chemistry, but wasn't sure like what career path that would lead to, whether it was in chemistry or more on the medical side. So it was a good place for that too. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, during your time at Case Western that you had done, uh, did you do any, yeah, you did undergraduate research, yeah, with uh, Professor yes. Thomas Gray. That's right. Uh, how did that kind of opportunity arise in, um, for you? Kind of serendipitously. Um, you know, it's, and he's honestly, he's the reason I'm in the field of inorganic chemistry and photochemistry today is kind of the origin point of all of that. That's um, great. It was, it was my second year. And, you know, at that time I knew that I wanted to start getting into research and obviously the way the course sequence goes here in the United States, you typically, you know, general chemistry and then organic. So, you know, organic faculty were really the only ones I knew that were research active. And so that's what I was kind of in the back of my mind thinking I was going to do. Um, but then you know, Thomas, Professor Gray had just started that year and, you know, it was his first year at the university. And he was, I think, just asking around to, you know, some of his colleagues, like, you know, who are some undergraduate students that might be looking for, for research. And, and so my name came up from one of his colleagues. So he, he actually reached out to, to me to see if I'd be interested. Hmm. Um, and so I went to his office and um, he took out a sealed quartz tube that had these um, hexanuclear rhenium clusters in it that he was working on at the time. And he held up a, a black light and they, they glowed bright red. And, and I was sold at that point. So I didn't really, I didn't really need to see much else. Um, and so that's how I got into inorganic photochemistry. And, um, you know, it was, his group was brand new at the time. So it was, I think also a good experience, even though it was, a, you know, a long time before I had my own lab, but to kind of see the, the evolution of a research lab as it gets started. You know, my following work was all with really established people, so it was a little bit different. But, you know, in, in Thomas's yeah. group, we were, you know, brand new, you know, and, and to be honest, in some in some ways, fumbling around a little bit, trying to figure out what, what was going to go. So I, you know, cycled through at least three different projects there before kind of finding some traction in something. Um, but I think that was very helpful in the long run. And, and you know, I had a great experience there, learned a lot, um, you know, got a few papers out, and it was, um, you know, until still to this day, I mean, I still collaborate with Thomas, and he's still, you know, an important mentor for me for all these years. So it's been it's been nice. That's an awesome story. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, that's a, that's that's quite a unique story to get like an email from a professor and like you want to come join us. Uh, glad you took it. I mean, were there any were you, were the thoughts of like, eh, I don't know if I want to go see this guy. You know what I mean? Like maybe as an undergraduate, like, eh, 
Well, it wasn't even an email. He came up to me like face to face because we were. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, were, yeah. we were in a teaching lab. I anyway, I don't think I made that clear before, but like we were in a teaching lab. So I was taking, I think, an organic lab at that time. He was teaching the inorganic lab, and you know the chemistry program at Case is pretty small. He had like you know yeah. about ten students in a class. So two two courses were sharing the same teaching lab. Yeah. And so he was in there at the same time. So I had seen him around, and then he just approached me one day during the middle of the lab and asked if I would come see him sometime. So it's especially hard to say no when they do that in person, but I was interested yeah, fair. at that point had not, you know, landed or committed myself to anything else. So I was certainly yeah. open-minded about it. I definitely want to get your opinion on this because obviously, like obviously you teach Gen Chem, but you also uh, spent a lot of time in the inorganic uh, chemistry world. So like you mentioned, inorganic chemistry isn't really taught until like the, uh, you know, upper level courses of chemistry students. I don't know. Do you think that we lose a lot of students because of the like organic section, I feel like a lot of students might be lost by the time they get to, um, like PCAM and inorganic that otherwise might have actually liked those courses. But I feel like I guess on the other hand, most organic students are pretty much in the, like only doing it because of medical school or whatever reason, anyways. So, but I, I don't know your thoughts on this. Like, if well, you feel like I mean, I've I've heard things of you know people trying to change the course sequence up to to you know go against what you just said i mean i think people that are intrinsically interested in chemistry should have you know no problem with organic it's a totally that's different fair. way of thinking thinking about things you know that's that's the struggle that a lot of students have with it is it's not you know it's not a brute force memorization plug and chug type of class you have to learn to recognize patterns and um you know synthesize things that you you know, concepts that you learn and synthesize them in new ways that you haven't seen before is a is a challenge. But I think at least, you know, even though I don't work in the field of organic chemistry now, I love the class. You know, it was mm. the first sort of real specialized chemistry class I took and I thought it was amazing. And it may, maybe I'm I don't know if I'm unique in that regard, but I feel like most students that have that drive to pursue chemistry would, would be fine with that. I think I think what you're where you're correct though is I think it does um you know, lead to sort of the research interests of a lot of undergraduates being skewed. A lot of them don't, yes. like I said, like I was in the same situation and kind of lucked out that Thomas approached me, but a lot of students don't even know what else is out there besides synthetic organic. That's the only, you know, specialized lecture course, the only specialized lab course they've had at that point. Um, so I don't know how you, how you'd sort of fix that because it's, it's, you know, hard to teach too many courses in the same year, especially when you have yeah, all absolutely. the general education things loaded up at the beginning, like calculus and physics and all that stuff. Um, I think it would be nice if we did a little bit more pure inorganic chemistry in the general chemistry course. You know, general chemistry mm. more or less has become, you know, physical chemistry light. You know, it's all, you know, numerical stuff and equilibrium, yeah. and especially, you know, the second semester is all equilibrium and kinetics and things, which I like, but, you know, you get basically no exposure to inorganic at all in a typical general chemistry course. Some places do a little bit, but here I don't think that's the case. Um, so I think, you know, that, that could help. Um, but I don't, yeah, it's, it does definitely, I think, skew the research interests of undergraduates. I mean, we see that at the, at the graduate level too. You yeah, know, for when, sure. When, when we review applications for, you know, for PhD admission, obviously the, the organic groups, you know, they get the most. And I mm. think that's part of the reason at least. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know. I think that'd be a good solution though, is like surely there would be a way to implement like inorganic lab work in the Gen Chem labs. Like surely there's a way to do it. I I don't know. Um Yeah, and I don't I don't remember I don't all the details. I've I've heard of some places at least talking about or even maybe implementing more of like a half semester module courses for chemistry majors where they don't do like a full course on, you know, or basically two full courses on organic before they do anything else. They kind of do like little pieces of, of each subject to kind of get them a taste at the beginning. And, mm. and there's, I think there's logistical challenges with that, but it sounds like it could yeah. be a neat idea. Yeah. At least for like the chemistry majors. Yeah. I could hear that like doing like yeah. breaking it up into the, the, the three different divisions, I guess. Before because our going I mean, fully. Uh, you know our chemistry program, our undergraduate chemistry program at UH has been has been shrinking over the years. I don't know if you guys catch wind of that as graduate students because the undergraduates um, or like yeah, so like, yeah, hmm. we, we you know our our courses are still high demand because of all the you like, know yeah, engineering and, and yeah and engineering and, and yeah bio yeah. chem and bio and all those. So like our 
you know, we're, we're still teaching a ton of students in those cases, but I think the number of students that are majoring in chemistry has, has dropped in recent years. Really? What's the percentage, yeah. you know, or? I'm not sure. I want to sure. I mean, yeah, we've, we've had sort of discussions about that as a department, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my okay. head. Um, okay. I, and obviously there's a lot of reasons for that. I think, um, especially when the economy is really good, you know, students get attracted into, you know, the chemical engineering, petroleum engineering, knowing that it's a more lucrative career option, especially with an <laughs> undergraduate degree. Um, uh, well, especially here in Houston, uh, the energy, you know, energy yeah. department, it's like, that um, is a, just I an mean, easy sell. And, Computer science has exploded in recent years too. Oh, yeah, you know, for sure. That's sort, of, that sort of viewed as your golden ticket to a six-figure <laughs> job these days, right out of college. So. I mean, tell you what, if, uh, I'm 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 learning. Well, I'm I'm going to be probably learning like some Python and coding courses now, just here as still as a grad student for these reasons. Like, there's just always opportunities it's, in tech. It's useful, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I'm I'm curious to see how like this will. It's not it's not even really a big problem, but it's just something that I've noticed. Like I mean, obviously, like the inorganic and PCM departments are always like noticeably smaller than the organic departments, and I don't know if that's a reflection of. I think you're right. There, there is just perception, even coming as an undergrad. So I don't know if that has like long term well, effects. Let's say, but I think it's course. You know, the course sequence is part of it, but then, you know, the re part of the reason is for the you know skewed faculty numbers is because of the number of you know, pre-medical students that have to take organic chemistry. Mm. So, you know, in, in most departments, you know, in, including, you know, University of Houston, general chemistry is kind of scattered between instructional faculty, physical chemistry, and inorganic. So it's, you know, divided up among two divisions, plus you usually have a bunch of instructional faculty that, that carry a lot of the load. Organic is only taught by organic faculty. So, you know, you need a lot of faculty just to cover those courses. Um, and so that I think is also just part of the reason why there's typically more organic faculty, which of course then leads to there being a, a need for more organic students and, and research positions and stuff. Yeah. Hmm. I, I didn't think about it that. That's a good uh, perspective. Um, but okay. So anyway, so yeah, you, you're at Case Western, um, you know, after Case Western, you went on to do your uh, PhD at, at, at MIT with a professor, uh, no, Sarah? No care, no, no Sarah. Sarah. No um, Sarah, yeah. Was, uh, was deciding to get your PhD, was that kind of an easy decision or how did that, you know, come about? Um, that's another sort of like thing where you don't, where it's not really a grand plan or a, you know, design <laughs> no, I, of all that. You know, I, I get, I, I, I understand that. <laughs> I mean, a little bit, well, I'm a little bit ashamed to admit, but I was, you know, as I said, initially when I entered college, I thought of maybe going into the medical field. I yeah. kind of feel embarrassed to even admit that to a chemistry audience, but, um, <laughs> you know, but then, you know, the, the first year at, um, at case, you know, I knew I was going to be a chemistry major, but I, I enjoyed the chemistry courses and especially the labs even more than I thought I would. And I took one biology class that was kind of a drag. So I really didn't want to, you know, put up with that for three or four more years. So then, um, you know, I was, thinking of, you know, making a little bit of a switch, not sure exactly. And then we went, you know, every year at Case, they have a, like an undergraduate recruitment event for the department. Mm. Um, because, uh, sorry, let me, I think I had, I just had a notification go off and I need to close. I don't keep disrupting. I don't know if that came through on the no, 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 you're good. no, no, you can't right. hear it. My end. Um, but anyway, um, they have an undergraduate recruitment open house and, and part of the reason is because we don't, we don't declare majors until the end of our first year. So you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're undecided your first semester and then departments kind of try to get you into their programs <laughs> and have these just, you know, they, they give you free food and have people talk about why it's great to be a chemistry major, all that stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, so my general chemistry instructor was there. Um, amazing guy. Um, he was a, you know, teaching instructor, not, not tenured, but like a, you know, incredible instructor. And, and he, um, was sort of leading part of this, this event. And he said, so we have the, you know, two, two programs at case, we have the bachelor of arts, which, you know, a lot of our pre-medical students do, it's more flexible. And then we also have a bachelor of science. That's for the, you know, the students that are really into chemistry and are going to go into it as a career. And he looks straight at me and goes, you're going to do that right, Tom? I was like, yeah, sure. Sounds good. <laughs> and so that kind of like locked me into the, you know, sort of Bachelor of Science chemistry sequence. Um, and then, you know, in the course of 
starting research especially i knew that you know getting a graduate degree was certainly what i wanted to do i was um you know, so it kind of, you know, during my first year, year and a half of college is when that plan to pursue a PhD sort of solidified. Yeah, that, that's hilarious. <laughs> it, it just happened like that. Um, yep. Now, it, it, so it makes sense then that you wanted to kind of, I mean, because if, if you like research, it makes sense to go do a, a graduate degree, especially when you're like not really sure about industry. It's like, why why do that? You know, you can go, um, you got to be a graduate student. Now going to MIT though, like, you know, did you have other options or did you apply to those schools or like what kind of brought you to MIT? Yeah, I, um, you know, that was one good thing about my, you know, my undergraduate advisor was, was really good about that too, kind of, you know, coaching me on which programs to look into that match my interests. I wanted to do at, you know, the two interests I had going into graduate school were either, you know, energy related mm. chemistry or or bioinorganic. I was kind of debating between those two fields. So, you know, Thomas really helped me identify PhD programs that were strong in those areas. Um, and so then I, you know, I got admitted to several places, um, visited most of them. Um, and I think what it, you know, there was, I was basically, I don't want to, maybe I don't, you know, I don't know how many names I should name, but there was, you know, basically a young professor at a different university that I was very interested in possibly doing a PhD with. And he was, I think, interested in having me in his group. And then there was, you know, Nocera at MIT, kind of the two that I, um, and I guess I, I, I kind of, in the process of visiting, decided that I would much rather do energy related chemistry. Mm. The other professor that I was considering was, he had a, you know, he had programs in both bioinorganic and energy, but his energy program had not yet really taken off in my estimation. So I thought, you know, the safer move and the probably better move for, for that, you know, goal of pursuing that area would be to go to Nocera's group, who was obviously already really well established in that field. Um, and I also had, you know, some perspective on his group because my undergraduate advisor was a postdoc with him before. So mm. I had that connection and was able to learn some things about the group and the, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of doing a PhD there and kind of sold me that it would be, I think, a good fit for me. Good, good running. Yeah. So what was your, um, well, so this is all before you had even like applied to MIT though, or I guess you were applying. So, well, it was, you know, yeah, Thomas helped me kind of identify places that I should apply to. And then, you know, during the spring before you enroll, you kind of visit them and, and yep. debate okay. them and, and stuff like that. So I got a lot of information during those times. And, um, you know, it was pretty certain that if I went to MIT, I would end up in, in the Nocera group and I actually started there even in the summer a little bit to get a little bit of a taste of it before officially enrolling. Um, you know, there, but there were other groups there that I think I would have been interested in if, if that didn't work out for some reason. So was, yep. I thought an overall good place for, for me to I be. Always, I always forget where... I always need to make sure where MIT is. I, I know it's in like right near Boston, but I don't think it's quite Boston proper. Actually, I don't really well, know. It's, well, is it's it Boston Cambridge, proper? which is it's, like it's in Cambridge, right next, yeah. which is you right across the river from Boston. So yeah, okay. You, know, you can walk. You can walk between Cambridge and Boston in ten minutes or less. Um, so I know. Yeah, I know. So I know that Cleveland probably definitely gave you a taste of the city life, but surely there was a actually. Well, actually, I don't know. I've never really been to. I've never been to Cleveland, but so was there kind of a jump then between Cleveland to Boston, or was it kind of like? Um, yeah, more Boston the northeast is, is, Yeah, Boston is much more of a fast-paced rat race kind of city than <laughs> Cleveland is. Um, Especially with all the fans know. there. I mean, the Red Sox, Bruins. Well, the, uh, yeah, the sports uh, scene is is, like, is pretty rabid there. And then you know, it was it's the type of place where you know very few people that live in the city, especially, have cars. There's a lot of and the yep. public transportation is good, so that was kind of you know I would use that a lot. Sometimes I would just walk to work because. You know, I didn't have a great route from where I lived to MIT, but the walk was nice. So, mm-hmm. um, but it was, really, yeah, it was, it's not, not the type of place that I would want to live forever, but it was a good for sure. experience and good place to be at that time in my life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Boston, uh, fantastic city. And obviously MIT, I mean, you know, what more can you say about the science that they, that they do there? Um, great science. What was your, what was your, what was you working on as a graduate student? Um, so I kind of had two parts to my PhD. So I started out doing um, photochemistry and we were interested in, um, you know, our, our, the group for a while had been working on, you know, photocatalytic hydrogen production where they were doing, mm-hmm. starting with you know, hydrochloric acid or hydrobromic acid, you know, H, HX sources and, and splitting it into 
the H2, which is hydrogen, of course, and then the, you know, the, the halogen X2. Um, if you want to, you know, a lot of people just focus on the hydrogen part, but in reality, if you're going to do energy storage, you need to drive an actual uphill reaction. You know, if you make, if you make hydrogen, but your reaction is thermodynamically downhill, you're not actually storing any energy. You're just making hydrogen. Um, so, you know, so that was kind of, you know, the, the approach was, um, you gotta be able to do both halves of it. And in the earlier work on that topic, you know, the, um, the elimination or the, the production of the halogen, the X2 was the more challenging step photochemically. So, um, another student who had started in Dan's group about two years before me, that was kind of his major focus. And then I picked up other directions related to that, where we were, you know, making late transition metal compounds. Um, I did some with gold, also some bimetallic compounds, which was kind of a, a big feature of that, of that project. And, um, you know, studied the photochemical elimination of, of halogen from them and how to, you know, improve the quantum yield and how to understand a little bit mechanistically what's going on. And that was kind of, that kind of took me through the first half of my PhD. And then, um, the second half was, was kind of a happy accident where, um, you know, was, was studying some, some related compounds and actually starting to get into sort of the full, you know, or trying to get into the full photo cycle of taking HCl and, and converting it into hydrogen and chlorine, kind of doing both halves of it and, and mm. you know, at the same time. And, you know, had a, a lapse of, of technique, which I guess is a little bit embarrassing to admit, but was letting oxygen in the system unbeknownst to me. So I, you know, was seeing oh, some boy. observations that I didn't really fully understand at the time. And, you know, but then I eventually figured out that oxygen was getting in and what I was actually doing in that chemistry was, was O2 reduction. So mm. making a, a metal hydride intermediate, but then that was reacting with oxygen. And so the second half of my PhD was, you know, intentionally making hydride compounds of that type, either again, bimetallic metal, metal bonded compounds with hydrides or, you know, simple coordination compounds with hydrides and then studying the mechanism of oxygen insertion into the hydride, which sometimes made a stable hydroperoxo, or then sometimes that would, you know, decompose further to release a reduced oxygen product. Um, so it was a lot of kinetics, you know, to use, to use, um, that kind of technique to understand mechanistic pathways and, um, you know, how to change, if we change the, the ligand coordination environment or the electronic structure around the metal, how does that influence the, the, the rates and the mechanisms of those processes? So it became much more of a, you know, kinetics project. And that's actually one thing I liked about, you know, Dan's group is that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a theme or a feature of his program at the time, but he did give people the freedom to explore. And so like mm. I said, that, that kind of came about accidentally. You know, that wasn't what I was trying to do at the beginning. Um, but he's, he, he lets people be as independent as they want to be. And if you find something that's interesting and want to, you know, go in depth and study it, he's, he'll let you do that. And that's what I was able to do for the second half of my PhD. And it was a lot of fun. Hmm. Just a quick question on the, on the first half of your PhD. Um, you know, making um, uh, the the dihalogens is, I mean, is that kind of safe though? Like if you're making like bromine or chlorine gas, like is that kind of, I, I don't really know the setup or, uh, you know, I mean, we're like doing that, them but... on small, we're doing them on small enough scales. I mean, the, the okay. one, one of the hard parts about that chemistry is, you know, usually in solution, um, you're going to have something that, that traps it. It is, you know, you're going to generate either halogen radicals or at least intermediates mm. that have halogen radical character. And you're going to, so in solution, you don't usually see a lot of, you know, the actual X2. And a lot of times you'll actually intentionally add a trap. We use, we use alkenes a lot, which, um, you know, that gives you cleaner photochemistry. You're, you're cheating a little bit, obviously, when you, when you add a trap, but you're, you're getting cleaner photochemistry. And then a couple, some things I did a little bit of too were, um, using sort of stereochemical insights to get at the mechanism. So if you, if you use a, um, I, now my organic chemistry is so rusty, but you know, if you use certain alkenes where, you know, you get syn versus anti-addition, you get different, um, diastereomeric products that you can distinguish from each other. Yeah. And so, you know, you, we, we, we kind of use that and looked at the, the halogenation products of the alkene to, to get at whether it was a pure radical mechanism or whether there may be more of a, you know, concerted X2 elimination and it's a little mm. bit complicated because I think we got, you know, also some photochemical isomerization of the alkene that, that complicated the analysis, but it seemed like it was possibly both happening, you know, some radical chemistry, but also formation of X2. We had products that were consistent with that. The, the experiment that we came up with 
to actually see X2. It's um, it's kind of you know clunky and brute force, but it worked. Was <laughs> to actually do solid state photochemistry. So we would just you know in a sealed glass or quartz tube, we'd evaporate a solution of our compound, so it kind of deposit it around the sides of the of the glass. You'd you sort of irradiate all sides of it and rotate. And we did it usually in a um, in like a U-tube kind of setup where then whatever volatile products came off would, would then be trapped on the other side. We had the, the other side of the reactor was in a, you know, liquid nitrogen bath or something. So yeah. Trap, trap the halogen there. And you could actually, you know, especially in the case of bromine, like you could see the color of the halogen that you were forming coming over to the other side. Um, and then to detect it and in some cases to try to quantify it a little bit, we would, you know, thaw that other half of the reactor and flow the gases through a, a GCMS, which could, mm. which was set up to, to detect gaseous products. You know, people use it also for, you know, other things like hydro, hydrogen, and oxygen, stuff like that. But we were able to detect the halogens that way. Um, and you could see, you know, with isotopic ratio that it was consistent with it being actually the, the product you were looking for. And then also get some quantification from the GC. So That's really cool. Stuff like that. I mean, it was, it was a cool experiment. It's not, it's not really a practical way of doing energy storage or anything like that. Um, Gotta start somewhere. wasn't wasn't my favorite experiment to do in the lab. It's kind of tedious, but um, it was you know another student and I kind of came up with that and optimized it, and we were able to in a few cases at least show that that was happening. That's really cool. Now for your second uh, uh, project, how did you come like? Because this actually might be beneficial for a graduate student. Like, how did you come? Like, how did you find out that O two was like getting into your system? Like, what was the like, how was that happening? Well, so yeah, the the observation was that um, so I was doing it, I was doing it on a on a Schlenk line. I mean, I was trying to keep O two out, just probably, mm-hmm. probably, probably not doing a good enough job. Um, but you know, the observation was that the I don't remember exactly. I think I was starting with the you know the reduced bimetallic compound. I was adding um, you know HCl, probably in dioxane, like an organic solution of, of HCl, not aqueous. And then, you know, letting it go for long periods of time and not even in that case, not even photolyzing it, just kind of seeing if they react with each other. And I was never seeing hydride containing products. I was always seeing the the fully oxidized, you know, chloride containing product, which mm. would have formed if I was making hydrogen. But in all of my efforts to detect hydrogen, I never saw it. Um, and then when I at some point just decided to be, you know, a little bit more careful, either setting it up totally in the glove box, or I think I ended up using a, a high vacuum line where it was, you know, a lot easier to, you know, a lot better for keeping any traces of air out. And when I did it much more carefully, I wasn't seeing that same outcome. I think I was actually seeing the hydride product in that case, but the hydride wasn't reacting further unless oxygen was present. And so Mm. then, you know, so then you do it, you know, more rigorously air-free, you don't see the same outcome. You see the hydride intermediate. And then when you introduce oxygen to that, then it progresses to, you know, the, the final outcome. So then I figure out, well, it has to be oxygen that's doing this. And then from there, you know, you just do a bunch of kinetic studies, mostly UV vis. It's a, you know, an a, a to B transformation, so it's it's pretty easy to monitor by UV vis. Um, all the products are, you know, highly colorful and everything. Um, and when you look at, you know, the rate law with respect to oxygen and things, you can kind of definitely tell. And, and we were able to also, in some cases, characterize the the reduced oxygen products. So in some cases, you would get a stable hydroperoxo. In in other Mm. cases, that thing would, you know, decompose in the presence of, of of additional acid to decompose on its own. It'd be hard, hard to trap and and isolate. But in some cases it was pretty stable. It could crystallize it, characterize it in the full, you know, full techniques that we'd always use. And um, so we were able to piece that together. Um, And there, there's, you know, there was related literature on mainly group 10 hydride compounds, palladium and platinum, where people had studied, similar processes we were doing group nine so it was you know a little bit different different starting point for us but we got a lot of insights from the literature too to help us understand what was going on that's really cool um any like you know i know sometimes general audience they want to hear like the big picture here but sometimes as chemists like we're not really we're not really exactly like they, we tend to not be like big picture applications here but like i, I was it's just kind of curiosity like you know what I mean, so the big right. the big picture for the the oxygen activation chemistry would be um, in in processes where you want to use you know O two as a as a terminal oxidant, which is you know viewed as a very green alternative for 
you know, in for, for oxidation, um, understanding how O2 reacts with um, the metal containing intermediates is, is important for, for being able to do that. Um, you know, so there's, we didn't do this kind of, you know, work in Dan's group, but there's, you know, some groups that were doing, you know, alcohol dehydrogenation with O2 as a terminal oxidant. Um, and really the, the, the tricky step there is not the dehydrogenation step, it's the turnover step with O2 to get back to your starting point. And so, mm. you know, understanding how that works and understanding the factors that control the rate and the, you know, I guess, like, to some extent, selectivity of that process in cases where it wasn't particularly clean, um, you know, understanding those could, could lead to, you know, benefits for, for catalytic applications involving O2 as your terminal oxidant. Yeah. True. Yeah. Love to hear it. So after, after your PhD, then, um, you know, you want to go do a postdoc at Caltech with John Paracall and, uh, LeBinger, I think, um, really, I mean, fascinating postdoc advisors, uh, <laughs> But was it, I mean, because people that go do postdocs, they typically, um, at this point, they're really thinking about you know, academia as a, as a, as a uh, you know, uh, I guess a long-term job, I guess I would say. But, or maybe the job market's just not right yet and you just kind of want to continue doing the science. So, you know, what were the decisions kind of going into thinking about doing a postdoc? Yeah, it was about, it was about halfway through my PhD when, when I decided that I would want to pursue an academic career. Um, so that was you know, so the last couple of years of my PhD, that was my focus. Um, and, you know, these days to get an academic job, you pretty much have to have a postdoc. There's, there's the occasional superstar that goes straight from PhD to faculty position, but it's very rare, especially now. Well, especially um, like tier ones, at least take tier one research, like basically. Yeah. If you're uh, going into PhD level type of, of university, that's, that's always the case. Um, so that was, you know, that was the career goal. And so and then I knew I had to do a postdoc and, um, you know, I, I uh, talked to my advisor a little bit um, about options, and he kind of, you know, sort of nudged me in the direction of of Burkha as, as a as a good choice for for what I wanted to do. And um, fortunately, you know, John John did a seminar at MIT while I was getting close to finishing up and about to apply to his group, so I was able to give a short research presentation, kind of it like worked my out. Mom. Kind of like my little audition for him, you know, <laughs> without having to even apply. So he saw what I did and, um, you know, his group does a lot of kinetics also. The, the work I ended up doing for him was was more, you know, thermodynamics than kinetics, which is actually nice to, you know, learn something new. So how the techniques to, to measure thermodynamics of, of different small activation, small molecular activation reactions. Um, so we, you know, so it was, I think, a pretty good match for my interests. And, um, and so then, yeah, it was lucky also to only have to apply to one postdoc position. I didn't have to send out a million applications. I just contacted John and he was interested enough to, you know, offer me the position right away. So that was easy. That's easy. Yeah. Any, uh, when you, uh, went to Caltech, cause I, is that in Pasadena? I wish we where Caltech is. Yeah, it's Pasadena. Yeah. Um, I mean the switch from Boston to Pasadena though, I mean, especially living in the Northeast pretty much your whole life and then just go down to SoCal. Um, it was pretty nice. Yeah. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> um, I guess what's interesting about, uh, professor John Burkhall, I'm not really familiar with, with, uh, LeBinger, but at least for Burkhall, I know, I mean, really one of the, I mean, pioneers in understanding polymer, like polymerization, like mechanisms of polymerizations, like really yeah, kind of, that, I don't know if, I don't know if that was kind of what you were working on, but I, I don't know how broad his research. Spanned. No, I was, I was one of the, few people in John's group that, that didn't work on olefins, okay. you know, ligamization, polymerization kind of stuff. So we had, um, it, it was sort of the other major effort in his group that had been going on. It was probably, you know, started maybe five, 10 years before I got there at the most. Um, it was, it's kind of related to, to syngas chemistry. So taking a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen is what you call syngas. You can, okay. you know, it can be, it can be, you know, you basically thermally degrade different precursor substances to get this mixture of syngas, I think. And and then, you know, industry, industrially, they want to know, can we combine this to make, you know, hydrocarbons, alcohols, things that are more valuable. Fair. Um, so what I was doing was related to that. And it was, you know, studying the key elementary step of um, inserting a hydride into a metal carbonyl. So, mm that's kind of viewed as one of the key steps that has to happen. So you, you know, are, are doing hydride attack on a carbonyl to make 
a formula and then usually you know any any sort of realistic proposal you would have for for upgrading syngas would start with that kind of key step but that's a thermodynamically challenging step to to execute so his group for a long time had worked on um using sort of pendant Lewis acids to promote that step where basically the Lewis acid coordinates to the oxygen on the formula and, and sort of, you know, gives a thermodynamic boost for that step. Um, I was interested in a little bit milder way of doing it, which was, um, you know, to, to use bronsted acids. So basically use hydrogen binding interactions instead of Lewis acid base interactions for kind of the same purpose mm -hmm. where you'd have a, a pendant base that would actually assist in the heterolytic cleavage of hydrogen to make the hydride that would then attack the formula and then you get hydrogen bonding between that protonated base and the formula to kind of stabilize it to some extent um so i studied the key steps for that a lot um not doing it exactly that way but basically doing a sort of stepwise thermodynamic cycle to understand you know if and how that would work um i mean the net result you know was that we we couldn't quite get the thermodynamics on our side for that transformation we were targeting. We understood exactly why. So it's, you know, one of those projects where the outcome's not what you're looking for, but you still gain scientific insight. Um so what was the I'm, what yeah, what was the uh the the outcome? Like what was the thermodynamics of it that Well so the out the outcome was that you know there's kind of um there's kind of two pieces to it that dictate the thermodynamics. How electrophilic is your carbonyl compound and how mm. strong is the base that you're using to assist in the heterolytic cleavage of hydrogen? And the issue we always ran into was that if you um, if you design the metal compound to make the carbonyl more electrophilic, there's you know different ways you can do that. You know, that's kind of there's some a lot of literature on that topic already. If you make the carbonyl compound more electrophilic, the the pendant base that you have on there becomes less basic as a result. There's kind of like this trade-off between the two terms mm. and then sort of vice versa. If you, if you try to put a stronger pendant base on your compound, you make that ligand more electron rich that has the base on it that reduces the electrophilicity of the carbonyl. So you can never quite get them both in the right, right range together. Mm. It was, it was kind of like a, you know, the inherent trade-off between the two terms that you needed to optimize. As there always so is. <laughs> yeah, so you know, we we deal with that in all different areas of research, um, and then those sort of inherent scaling relationships that we were never quite able to overcome. So we were, at times, we were close. I mean, we we estimated that we were within, you know, a few kcal's of being thermodynamically favorable for the step we wanted to do. But then, if you translate that into the hydrogen pressure you would need to drive it, you're looking at you know obscenely high pressures of hydrogen that are not not safe in any environment let alone a, a, you know academic lab so we never quite got got to the the finish line that we were looking for but we we understood why it was and um you know learned a lot about the individual thermodynamic steps just couldn't quite piece it all together in the time yeah, that I was there it is definitely a, a great learning lesson i think for a lot of like let's say young impressionable students like i mean this is exactly it. it's like a lot of projects you're not going to like the answer to it. You know, it's just the science is what it is, I guess, in some respects, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, when you, you know, if, if I'm going to give some unsolicited advice to students in that situation or postdoc <laughs> situation, um, you know, the, the key is to not be too fixated on exactly what your target outcome is to have a little yeah. bit of an open mind and along the way, try to learn what you can, you know, yeah. especially as a graduate student, you know, your goal is to make a dissertation. So you got to have, you got to have data, you got to have insights to put in there, whether they're ultimately what you end up wanting or not. Um, so mm -hmm. just, you know, learn things along the way. And sometimes, you know, occasionally learning things along the way kind of gets, so gets you over that hurdle that you're up against, you know, yeah. as, opposed, as opposed to just stopping and trying to randomly redesign the system, actually, you know, figure out what's going on. And that'll, that'll kind of guide, guide your future efforts. But, um, you know, it was, you know, as a postdoc, you only have about two years to get, to get, things going so we just we never quite solved it in those two years and john's group was also um you know kind of starting to wind down at that time he had mm -hmm. he retired about a few years after i left so at the time that i was there his last graduate students were finishing up and then he was kind of transitioning to a, a small but only postdoc group by the time i was finishing so i don't think anybody really directly took over what i was working on either so we got mm -hmm. you know, we got a couple of papers out that were fun to work on and, and I think fairly insightful, but yeah, just not quite the ultimate goal that we were setting out to achieve at the beginning. Yeah. 
yeah, I stand for great advice is like not not being fixated on the on the outcome, you know. And yeah, that's, I definitely I definitely hear that as a graduate student. It's like sometimes you just <laughs> you you get pitched an idea by your you know your mentors and your advisors, and it's like oh it's you know this is what we're after, and it's gonna if this works, this will be fantastic. But it just many times it doesn't work out that way, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and I try to you know coach my own group on the idea that you know it's not it's not a binary it worked or it didn't work outcome you know it's, right. it's what it's what did you learn from it you know what happened exactly you know when you say it didn't work that can mean a lot of things okay um, and if you and sometimes it's hard to figure out obviously like sometimes it's just a intractable mess that you get and then you're kind of stuck in the mud but in, in a lot of cases you can learn what happened and learn why it didn't work and then that on its own might be interesting or that may lead you into a direction that's that's more promising for what you're trying to do mm -hmm. yeah so after your postdoc i assume you started you know started applying to the academic academics now and so yep. he came down to, to houston i don't know if he applied anywhere else but that's neither here nor there because uh, now <laughs> an associate professor here yeah. <laughs> um um yeah so let's 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 get into what um you know i've been in the department for a year and a half now but to be honest, I don't really even know what you do. I know you do photoluminescence, but I'm be honest, like it's way out of my wheelhouse. So I know you do a lot of deep blue near IR photoluminescence, you know, photocatalytic reactions. But I'm gonna let you take the floor here and you know really uh, boost up your your program. Yeah, so our our, our program combines uh, synthetic organometallic chemistry as well as some you know physical and organic and, and you know photophysical type approaches. Um, what what we're interested in is sort of you know, understanding how to use, uh, you know, ligand design and, and molecular structure to to control the dynamics and the redox properties of triple excited states. That's kind of at the center of most of what we're doing. Um, so there's a few different applications we work on. Um, and so, you know, one of those, as, as Aiden mentioned, is photoluminescence in the extremes of the spectrum. There, there's kind of different challenges in those areas. So, you know, different approaches you have to take. And in both cases, um, you know, it's kind of a limitation on, on materials that have high performance for photoluminescence in those areas. And, and you know, for the blue region, the, the, the big technological relevance is organic light emitting diodes, OLEDs. So anybody mm -hmm. that's been, you know, shopping for a phone or a TV recently has probably seen that acronym. Um, and, the, you know, the commercialized devices, they have, you know, organometallic iridium compounds that, that work really well for the red and green regions. But... In the blue region, there's there's not anything that works as well. They're at the at the present time, they're sort of sacrificing efficiency for stability. So if you could come up with a you know organometallic blue phosphorescent compound that is you know really efficient and really stable for that application, it would it would be certainly a technological game changer. I think. Um, so we work a lot on that, and that's kind of the I guess the big picture application focus of it, especially for for the blue region. Um, and then we also have gotten involved. Um, you know, in photoredox catalysis, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier that I left organic chemistry behind a long time ago, but, um, you know, we kind of are now back into that a little bit. We had, that project kind of started out as, you know, photosensitizer design. So, you know, designing molecules that have um, exceptionally strong, that are, that are exceptionally strong reductants in their excited state and understanding how to control that from, you know, mostly a thermodynamic standpoint. We also looked at kinetics of electron transfer from those excited states and, and found some insights there. But then in recent years, that has become more or less a, a methodology project where because we have these really strong excited state reductants, we can target substrates and transformations that are otherwise difficult to do uh, using the, the more typical photosensitized that, are, that everybody's kind of working with. So that's, you know, luminescence and photoredox catalysis are kind of the two major areas. Other things that we're involved with a little bit um, we had, um, we have, we have a project on ratiometric oxygen sensing. So these are, you know, compounds that have two luminescent signals and they respond differently to oxygen. And that ratio of the two signals is kind of your readout. So it's a, you know, accurate reproducible way of, of measuring oxygen. And, um, you know, we're developing strategies to sort of access those types of, of sensors in a more synthetically streamlined way and in, in, a, in a way that allows us to more easily modify their their properties than is kind of available today. And then we kind of, we don't have the funding for this anymore, but uh, we might pick it up again if we ever have the opportunity. We have a collaboration with the Army Research Lab on nonlinear optical materials. So there's sort of the, the fundamental side, which is um, 
And some part of that is sort of, you know, supramolecular coordination driven self assembly. So making polynuclear metal compounds and, and which we think might be valuable for that application. But then a lot of it is also just a little bit more applied, you know, with simpler structures, just um, looking at their nonlinear optical properties where we, you know, we in, in our group, we make the compounds and do a lot of the, the ground state photophysical characterization. And then our collaborators at the Army Research Lab do the, the higher level, you know, laser spectroscopy analyses that we need for, for that project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so generally, uh, generally speaking, you know, I know your lab kind of works with a lot of iridium complexes. A question, you know, maybe like for the kind of the audience is like, you know, what properties of iridium kind of allow you to do a lot of this this chemistry? Like, and why can't you do this with, let's say, other metals or like, you know, base or earth abundant transition metals, let's say? Yeah, there is. I mean, there's obviously a push for a lot of these applications to move to earth abundant metals. In in reality, for for things like for OLEDs, you know, there's a very tiny amount of iridium in them compared to all the other device components, especially when you're putting a whole phone together. I mean, the, you know, the phone is worth a thousand dollars these days and the amount of iridium in there is a very tiny fraction of that cost. Um, so there's not a huge push to move away from that. And the reason for iridium and why it's kind of emerged is there's, there's, you know, a few things going on there, but um, when you, when you want to make a compound for an OLED, you know, there's, there's two major mechanisms for luminescence. Um, mm. You know, there's fluorescence and there's phosphorescence, um, probably terms you've heard before, whether you know exactly the difference, you know, and phosphorescence involves luminescing from a triplet excited state. And that's what most heavy metal organometallic compounds do. Now that's desirable for OLEDs because that gives you higher device efficiency. It harvests the excitons more efficiently and, you know, your theoretical and practical efficiencies are much higher when you use phosphorescent materials in the OLEDs. So that kind of narrows you down then to, and that, that narrowed down a lot of the focus on organometallic compounds for those applications. And why iridium in particular, the other thing that you need for an OLED um, is you want to have really fast radiative rates. One of the limitations mm. of phosphorescence is that in many cases with phosphorescence, you get really long excited state lifetimes. So the decay is very slow because it's a spin forbidden process. Um, I don't know how technical I'm supposed to get on this podcast, but you know. That's this, a, this, I, this, we this can do whatever... I, we can do whatever is, we want here. We can do whatever we want. What I, so. This is what I geek out about every day. So cut, cut me off if I'm going to. No, deep, listen, but, bring it on. It's um, on the geekiness. I love it. All right. So like in the, you know, so most phosphorescent compounds have really slow radiative rates, really long lifetimes. And that's not desirable for OLEDs for a few different reasons. Um, but with iridium, you get essentially out of all the phosphorescent compounds that have been studied or, you know, they're, they're among the fastest in terms of the radiative rates. Mm. Um, and the other nice thing about them is, um, it's pretty easy with iridium to 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 cyclometallate, so to make those you know chelated structures where you have a metal carbon bond, and metal aryl bond as part of it, yep. and that's important for a couple reasons as well. I mean that that helps with that fast rate of rate that's important for the you know photochemical mechanism. Um, it's also you know because it's so easy to cyclometallate, it's really easy to to tune the structures and change the color of the emission with iridium compared to some other metals. Um, and so it kind of just has almost everything you're looking for, honestly. And it's like, except for the blue region, it's been, you know, wildly successful in, in all, all parts of the spectrum. And, um, you know, there's thousands and thousands of patents on cyclometed iridium compounds used for OLEDs and commercialized devices that use them. Obviously, you don't know exactly what materials you're using because they're pretty secretive about that. But it's it's that, you know, that compound, that type of compound has been widely adopted. Um, so, you know, there would be a a desire in, in a lot of applications to go to, to base metal counterparts. The, the challenge with most base metals, um, particularly if you're looking at things that are, you know, isoelectronic with um, iridium, you know, like cobalt three or, you know, iron two, stuff like that. It's all that middle D electron counts um, is they all have these, you know, DD excited states or ligand field excited states that are, um, you know, whenever you have partially filled d orbitals with iridium, those same excited states are very high in energy, so they're out of the way. They don't really affect anything that's mm. happening in the photochemistry, except for in the blue region. That's one of the challenges of the blue that we that we still have. But you know, in most part, in most cases, you don't have to worry about those for iridium. But for three D transition metals, those ligand field excited states are pretty low in energy, and they're usually you know those states tend to be non radiative. So if you access those states, the, it just decays to the ground state very fast. There's no productive luminescence or any sort of photochemistry that can happen from that. So getting, you know, controlling the energies of those states and, and making them 
you know, not be such a big problem is, is really a, a huge challenge. And there's been some strides in that area, but, you know, the, the performance metrics for base metal compounds are still, you know, well lagging behind what you can get for, for iridium and, and certainly mm-hmm. not as versatile in terms of what you can do with them. So people are, you know, they're making a lot of effort on that. We do have one part of my group now working on, um, you know, copper compounds for photocatalysis applications. Copper is kind of, especially copper one is kind of the um, sort of the cheap approach because now you have a D10 electron configuration, so you don't have to worry about those ligand field states at all. But there's still other challenges with copper, and, and you know, so we're we're addressing some of those in our in our research for other applications. But yeah, it'd be great. You know, people would love it if you could replace iridium with a base metal, but it's just so far not practical to do that. Um, I, I, a few questions about this chemistry is then okay so surely by now we definitely understood is it well understood like let's say for iridium let's say in the red and green or is it red through green right it's the blue region that's not or like well, i don't I mean, know typical, yeah, a typical um you know a, a typical device is three colors rgb so that's really yeah. the need for like a display technology um but pe- you know people have looked at i would say for iridium you know anything from what you would call sky blue into the red region, that whole spectrum in there is pretty pretty well established, and at least not a huge priority for industry to to improve. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in the red region in near infrared, which we work on, there are some there are some fundamental challenges, and I think some room for improvement there. It's not as big of a priority as blue, but we've we've been doing we've had a lot of effort on that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they they work really well, and the device efficiency, and especially the device lifetime, is you know totally fine for for practical purposes. Um, but yeah, it's the deep blue, which you need for a, a really, you know, sharp color display. You need that deep blue pixel. And that's been the challenge that the industry is still very much uh, tackling these days. Okay. Now, so in, in these, let's say in these well-established Iridius, Iridius systems, is it known, surely it's known like what, you know, electrons are being excited? Like where are these, what orbitals are being accessed, I guess? Like, I don't know if you're able to explain yeah, this. Yeah, so like typically which one. Um, in these compounds, the... The highest occupied molecular orbital, the HOMO, is um, you can think of it as primarily a you know a metal based T two G orbital. So if you're you know familiar okay. with octahedral coordination compounds, you have T two G and E G, and the you know these are D six compounds. So the T two G orbitals are filled, and that's kind of be your HOMO. There is some delocalization typically onto the arrow rings of the cyclometallane ligand, so it's not a you know totally localized HOMO, but it. And then the the LUMO is typically a pi star orbital, and in most cases it's on the nitrogen heterocycle that's part of the cyclometallane ligand. So it's mm. a little bit different, you know, localization. So you can think of the excited states in these compounds as primarily being metal to ligand charge transfer. There's also like a little bit of, you know, there's also some character from, you know, basically a ligand center pi to pi star transition because it involves orbitals on the cyclometallane ligand as well in both in both the HOMO and the LUMO. So um, it's kind of a mixture of those two primarily. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay. Now, and, you know, in kind of a theme of our work in in the red region has been, you know, kind of tuning that character between metal to ligand charge transfer and, and ligand center and how that can help you improve radiative rates and quantum yields and things like that. So we, we've kind of been involved with that in the red region and then kind of understanding how those excited states are and um, how to manipulate them in ways that can improve things for you. Okay. Now, for uh, these... I guess maybe maybe it would be beneficial is actually explaining how like these iridium compounds emit light. It actually might be beneficial for some people. Like where does the where does the photon come from? Or like, you know, so I, you know yeah, so, how does that work? You know, the way that the way that we kind of study the compounds at a fundamental level is with, you know, photoluminescence. That's the most typical way to study luminescence. Where you, you photo excite that promotes an electron into a higher energy level as you just, you know, asked about. And then that electron relaxes back, and that's when the the photon is generated. Now there's, um, you know, there's some complicated, there's some uh, you know intricacies in there that I won't get into too much. But basically, it's just that you know promotion of electron to a higher energy orbital, and then when it relaxes back down, a photon is generated. Um, you you know it doesn't happen 100 percent of the time. So as I said, a big part of what we do and what's important in this field is controlling the efficiency of that process. Mm. So there's also, you know, thermal non-radiative deactivation pathways that you compete with. So it's really a competition between those two. And then understanding the kinetics of those individual processes is how you can 
you know, optimize the efficiency. You basically want the radiative rate to be as fast as possible. You want the non-radiative rate to be as slow as possible. Um, but it really is just, you know, an electron relaxing back down from, you know, the higher energy orbital to lower energy orbital that is what drives the, the generation of light. Um, and so that's kind of at the, the heart of it. And, you know, when, when you're in a device, the only, the only major difference is just how you generate that excited state. So in a, in an OLED device, it's electroluminescence. So you're not, you're not putting a photon in to excite it. You're putting an electrical potential in mm. and that potential kind of simultaneously. So you have your, you know, your homo is initially doubly occupied and that electrical potential simultaneously removes an electron from the homo, adds an electron to LUMO and then generates that same type of excited state. Both it's, it's a you know, energy transfer process. So it's not as simple as what I described, but you're getting basically that same state where you have one electron up here, one electron down here, and then they recombine to generate light. Um, uh, so it's okay. just a different way of accessing that same excited state, but it's the the same process once you get there. I was I was going to ask you how it kind of works. Like let's say like on yeah on on L O L E D S. Um, uh, you might have explained this, but I I, I might have just missed it on uh, why iridium can't do like deep blue um, phosphorescence. Is it what what so, like what properties can so it really it, do? So it can it it can do deep blue phosphorescence, but the um, the efficiency and especially the stability of that is is not what you need it to be for, okay. um, you know, for a practical device. And the reason is I, I talked about those those ligand field states, those DD states that are problematic, especially in the three D series. Well, if you have deep blue phosphorescence, you need your excited state that you're emitting from to be pretty high in energy as well. It's you know blue mm -hmm. is the highest energy you know photon, so the gap that you're trying to cross has to be big to get blue photons out. And so when your excited state energy is, is high enough, it starts to get close enough to those ligand field states where they become thermally populated. And so when you thermally populate those ligand field states, um, they're non-radiative, so you reduce your efficiency. But the bigger problem is, um, and again, anybody who's taken a you know inorganic chemistry course would appreciate this, when you populate those ligand field states, you're putting electrons up into those EG orbitals, the higher line D orbitals. And those D orbitals are anti-bonding with respect to the metal and ligands. And so mm -hmm. over time, as you populate those orbitals, things just fall apart. You, you get ligand dissociation, other degradation um, pathways that, okay. that prominate, and then your, you know, your compound falls apart and your, your device degrades. So it's really the, the lifetime of, of blue devices with any phosphorescent material that are kind of standing in the way of their widespread application right now. The, the efficiency is still pretty low and you'd like to improve that, but you know, they don't last long enough is the bigger issue. So like I said, in commercial devices now, they're using organic materials to generate the blue light where they're stable enough. They last long enough to be practical, but their efficiency is, is taking a hit as a result. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, uh, I follow yeah. that now. That makes sense. Yeah. So how I guess, so then obviously like how, how is your group trying to like um, fix this problem? Let's say like what, what, so can, what you, can be done? The, the kind of classic way to approach this is, um, you know, if you want to fix the problem I just described, um, you need to destabilize those higher lying ligand field states, get them out of the way, um, you know, make them even higher in energy so they can't be firmly populated. And that can happen with really strong sigma donor ligand sets. So there's been a lot of, you know, nice work out there uh, extensively using n heterocyclic carbenes for um, blue phosphorescent compounds. And it's for mm -hmm. that reason. Their NHCs are really strong sigma donors and they, destabilize that higher lying state and improve the efficiency and stability. We're trying to sort of push the envelope even further and go to other classes of carbene ligands that are even stronger sigma donors than NHC. So the one that we focus on extensively are acyclic diaminocarbenes. They're, they're not that different. They're still a diaminocarbene, but by opening up the five-membered NHC into an open structure, you get much stronger sigma donation that's been well established. So the you know, the hurdle to getting into that was sort of establishing the synthetic chemistry. You don't have the the same types of approaches available for acyclic carbenes as you always do with NHCs. And so we yeah. had to come up with some sort of unconventional ways to make that. And a lot of that insight was already out there in the organometallic literature. It just had not been applied in this area before. So it was really mm. kind of combining insights from two fields, taking, you know, the organometallic synthesis and the, you know, sort of ligand characteristics that have been worked out in that field and kind of bringing them into the field of, you know, blue phosphorescent organic metallic compounds where we've done it with both at this point, iridium and platinum and, and shown that in many cases, the, the acyclic carbines are, are particularly effective at reducing the non-radiative rate constant, which does lead to 
improvements in quantum yield. You know, so we're um, we finally have a, a postdoc in my group that can um, make OLEDs. It's something we hadn't really had the capability of doing before. Um, so mm-hmm. she's been looking at the uh, blue blue devices are are particularly challenging as it turns out as well. But um, she'll eventually kind of start putting those things into devices and and seeing if we actually get any improvements in device performance as a result. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm 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 looking at this now because that sounds a bit. It sounds a bit. Um like counterintuitive to me because I mean the way, cause I and definitely shine some light on this. Cause I feel like the a Siku version of this carbines, are they like, I don't understand how they're more stronger singly Sigma doning than let's say the cyclic version. That doesn't really, that doesn't really sound intuitive to me. So the, the most common explanation for that is the, um, if you want to invoke hybridization, if you're okay with me doing that. So basically yeah, let's do the, it. yeah, let's do it. All right, so the I know I know organic chemists are usually okay with that. Inorganic chemists not as much, but um, if you think about the hybridization of that sigma orbital on the carbene, um, so when you're when you have a cyclic carbene, you're you're constraining that angle to be about 105 degrees, the NCN yep. angle in the diamond okay. carbene, and that in, that requires then that you have more p character, sorry, more s character in that homo, and then when you go to in a cyclic carbene, that angle opens up to basically the perfect 120 degree angle. So you get, you know, pure sp2 hybridization and, and more p character in the homo, basically. Oh, um, so the p okay. character increases in the in the sigma homo, which makes it a stronger sigma donor than you would get in a cyclic carbene. Uh, okay, that is a yeah, that makes sense. I might have to take a look at these these uh these acyclic carbenes. We, we've been interested in, in like. Uh, for catalysis reasons, strong sigma donors, but these yeah, are kind of interesting. Yeah, there's a couple thing. couple of groups that have have looked at them in catalysis. Um, one at North University of North Texas, who um, Lee Slaughter, and they do mostly uh, coinage metals, so a lot of gold, acyclic carbon yeah. compounds, maybe some some with group ten as well. Um, so the synthetic chemistry to access those types of things is out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has, but there's, it's a, you know, it's, I think it's a it's an interesting ligand class, but certainly not nearly as widely adopted as NHCs. I mean, not even close. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this has been, uh, the NHCs, I, I don't know. I forget when it was first synthesized, but they've been, they've been known for like, I mean, what, 20 years at least? They've been known. Yeah. They've known uh-huh. for a long time. And I mean, probably even longer than that. I yeah. I forget when the R- first like R- isolated version. Yeah. I don't know when the first yeah, isolated, isolated papers, version. I mean, those were even longer than that. I mean, the, the other nice thing about NHCs, as you may know, is that you don't always have to make the free carbine. You can do, yeah. you know, transmetallation routes from the imidazolium precursors and things that can get to the metal carbine compounds without even having to, you know, deal with the comparatively unstable free carbines. Um, with mm-hmm. acyclic diaminocarbines, those types of transmetallation routes are not as available, which is why we've kind of focused mainly on, I mean, probably exclusively on a approach where you take a coordinated isocyanide and do nucleophilic addition to prepare the carbine. So it's more of a, yeah. a ligand-based functionalization approach that we've we use. And again, we didn't invent that. That's been out there for a long time as well, but we've been applying it in the in the field of photochemistry mm-hmm. and one of the first groups to do that. Now on so now let's take let's go to the end other end of the spectrum because we mentioned like rare, red and near red phosphorescence. So what may what was the problem with, with this type of um for these iridium complex on this end? Yeah, so there's um there's this widely known concept called the energy gap law, which basically stipulates that as you get to lower and lower energy excited states or longer and longer emission wavelengths, um, you tend to have lower quantum yields. And that energy gap law specifically deals with the non-radiative rate constant. But another issue in the red region that's not as widely appreciated, I feel like, is um, there's also a relationship for the radiative rate constant from quantum mechanics that has a cubic dependence on the excited state energy. So as okay. you go to the red and near infrared region, you also tend to have slower radiative rates as well. So both of those are kind of working against you. So if you look at just sort of the metrical parameters that are out there, if you if you have, you know, green phosphorescent cyclometallated radium compounds, um, you know, there's many examples in the literature that have photoluminescence quantum yields of basically 100%, you know, mm-hmm. quantitative. And then the devices you make from those are, are, uh, you know, the most efficient that you can have. In the red region, um, you know, the, 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 the best performing compounds have quantum yields that are, you know, maybe on the order of 50% typically. So it's, okay. you know, and, and so again, from a industry practicality standpoint, they're fine with that. And the, but the devices are, 
likewise not as efficient for that reason. Um, and so I, there is room for improvement, even though it's not a huge priority in the, in the industry. But um, and the reason for that, as I said, you know, that people have kind of overlooked in some ways, I think, is the, you know, the slower radiative rate constants is, you know, one thing that hasn't really been addressed as much. And so we looked at um, and it was perhaps a little bit serendipitous. We weren't really targeting this at the beginning, but um, a lot of cyclometallate iridium compounds that have been used for OLED applications, uh, I'm not sure if they use these in industry, but definitely in the you know academic literature, they're everywhere. They have you know two cyclometallating ligands that controls the, the phosphorescence color, and then mm-hmm. an ancillary ligand that's usually just acetyl acid, and ACAC, which is cheap, really easy to install synthetically, and um, more, more or less spectroscopically inert, though. We just kind of became curious about what would happen if we replaced ACAC with isoelectronic analogs that have one or more nitrogen atoms in them. So the, you know, ketoeminates or diketoeminates are the most structure related to ACAC. But, uh, you know, basically these, you know, what happens if we start incorporating electron rich nitrogen containing ancillary ligands into these compounds? And again, it was... The NACNAC? The NACNAC ligands? Yeah. I mean, NACNAC <laughs> is one of them. NACNAC has worked well for us in, in photoredox, not so much for luminescence as it turns out. But okay. um, we've, we've, we've studied them a lot. And then again, our the very first paper from my research group in 2015 was on cyclometallic iridium compounds that had the ketoeminate or diketoeminate HACNAC or NACNAC ligands. And really, we just started that project because, um, again, I guess I'll be totally honest about how it got started, not pretend like I'm a genius that, that got this started. <laughs> we, my first year, I had more students joining my group than I expected. I needed I wanted something for myself to work on because I was still in the lab a lot at that point. So I was like, well, let me just start trying this. We were, we were doing some, you know, some, we, we started doing, again, because we needed more projects for people to work on, not because we had originally planned it. We started working also on a on a class of redox active ligands called formazinates. And we, we did a lot with those over a few years. We kind of scrapped that project at this point. But those those ligands are structurally very similar to diketaminates. They just have two extra nitrogen atoms in the core. So I was like, well, okay, if we're going to make the formazinates, Let's make the diketaminates too as a as a nice comparison point, and that got us into um, iridium compounds with diketaminates, and then we kind of varied it from there. And you know, we kind of started to recognize in that early work that as you go to like longer wavelength phosphorescence, you do see some improvements in the efficiency, and then also in the radiative rate constant. Once we were able to quantify that, so then we started targeting you know things deeper and deeper into the red. Um, to do that and, and kind of what we've sort of settled on as an explanation for it is, um, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier that the excited states in these compounds are kind of a blend of the metal to ligand charge transfer as well as sort of a pi to pi star, you know, ligand center type state that, that sort of mixed through configuration interaction. And, you know, the, the key to having a fast radiative rate constant is to have a lot of spin orbit coupling in the excited state. And that spin orbit coupling comes exclusively from the metal ligand charge transfer states. So basically you need to increase the contribution or the character of the metal ligand charge transfer if you want to increase your radiative rates. And we think that's what these electron rich, strongly donating ligands are doing for us. They're mm. basically stabilizing MLCT states so that they are now the more major contributors to the excited state. And because we have more MLCT character, we're getting faster radiative rates. So that's kind of the consistent outcome we see. You know, we don't we don't always get higher quantum yields, although we do have examples now of you know red emitting compounds that have you know quantum yields of close to eighty percent in solution, which is you know really good for that region. Um, but the consistent outcome we see over a lot of compounds, um, you know, most things that we've looked at at this point, is that we do get increases in the radiative rate that's often driving that increase in quantum yield that we sometimes see. Mm. Cool. Uh, the last thing I want to, I wanted to touch on before we wrap up here is, you know, your, your role in a kind of coming back to photo redox catalysis. Cause obviously, um, I mean, I mean, huge field, especially there's a lot of promise for that. Um, yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, industrially, but also just like, there's so much with, I would say, well, I don't know how fair to say that so much is not known, but there's, there's just a lot of uses for it, let's say. And so in your group, you know, where did you kind of start out with and like what sort of uh, reactions yeah, are you so trying my to run? Group, you know, we don't, we don't know anything about, or I would maybe not, I don't want to say anything, but very, very little about, you know, what are the interesting transformations or what are the, yeah. you know, things that, and it's, it's honestly 
it's hard to sometimes know what organic chemists care about. They have very strong opinions about things most of the time. Um, Fair. <laughs> so we, you know, but but the angle that we came at, at this from, and, you know, there's there's a couple groups around, you know, a few other groups around the world that are kind of in this sort of, in this sort of niche, but it's not, it's not nearly as widespread as the people that are doing methodology, but was to, you know, design new photosensitizers that would, enable advances in photoredox catalysis and especially from the standpoint of, of substrate scope because we are you know in most photoredox transformations the initial step is you know you excite the photosensitizer the photocatalyst whatever you want to call it and then that initiates an electron transfer event often to the substrate directly and the types of so then you know thermodynamically you're sort of limited you know the types of substrates you can use you need you know you need a redox potential of your photosensitizer to be in the right range to be able to transfer or accept an electron from your substrate. Um, we mostly do re reductive transformations, so we're, we're primarily thinking about electron transfer from that state. Um, and so a lot of substrates are, are difficult to use as, as a result of being challenging to reduce. So unactivated organohalides, um, a lot of, you know, carbonyl, like ketone, alde or ketone aldehyde, yeah. amine type substrates are, are challenging to use as a result. So we wanted to see if, if we could access photosensitizers that are <clears throat> more strongly reducing, you know, that was kind of our initial play in this. And that also kind of dovetail out of that first publication from our group where, you know, honestly, the most useful reviewer comment I ever got was we had not even had that on our radar, but we, we published this paper that had, you know, photophysical properties, redox potentials of, of these dicodeminate compounds. And one of the reviewers said, well, looking at your potentials, I think these are going to be, you know, really strong photoreductants. You guys should look into that. And so then hmm. you know, that became a major focus of ours. You know, a student that joined the following year kind of took that on and made it, you know, his PhD project. And um, we started, you know, again, initially just sort of understanding the, the fundamental photoredox properties. You know, how do we control the redox potentials? Does that lead to you know, in, improve kinetics for electron transfer, all that kind of physical and organic stuff. And then eventually recognizing that, well, okay, so we have these really potent photoreductants, let's start applying them for organic synthesis. And initially doing things that weren't, you know, very interesting or really not interesting at all synthetically, you know, hydro dehalogenation, but it's mm -hmm. a good way to sort of establish substrate scope to see, yeah. you know, what, what kind of or, or, organohalide substrates do these work with. And again, under, you know, very simple visible light conditions without any, you know, additives or other things that people often use for those difficult subjects, we were able to do that. And then more recently, um, you know, I finally had a student join my group who was, who had a really strong background in synthetic methodology and an interest in doing it. And he's been driving a, an effort in our group on, you know, more synthetically useful transformations, again, enabled by these strong photoreductants that we have that can react with a much wider range of substrates than is often possible. Yeah. Uh, so our, our most our most recent effort was on you know carbon carbon bond formation reactions, starting with mm. ketones or ketones or amines as the as the substrates. Yeah, that's really interesting because especially to hear it from like the like the inorganic side, like really tuning the redox potentials of these is, soon, is certainly really interesting. I think. Um, so yeah, it's kind I mean, of a most unique organic perspective. groups kind of yeah they kind of grab photosensitizers off the shelf and right. do what they can do with them, which is I mean just fine. like bippy bippy that. iridium and that's it yeah just like that's yeah, the one they're gonna go those with. Those things are those things are you know very commonly like, done. Right. But yeah, we thought we <laughs> thought there was there was possible room for for growth, and I think you know I should probably talk to my organic colleagues more about you know transformations that we could target because I do think we have a system in hand that allows us to you know access some some radicals from precursors that are often difficult to use. Mm -hmm. It's just the challenge for us is kind of coming up with transformations that we could leverage that for that people in the organic field would be interested in. So I have a, qu I have cool. a question actually about, I guess the like redox potentials in general, do you want the potentials to be as wide as you can to be able to access, let's say different, uh, I guess in this case it would be functional groups, but also, um, but do you, but wouldn't that be counterintuitive? Like when you want our photo redox potential to be, specific for certain things like I, I, I or yeah it's not always so like, as i said we mostly target reductive transformations so the key metric for that is the um the excited state potential which we call the excited state oxidation potential is basically the the potential associated with transferring an electron after excitation so you mm. um and it is true that at at some level you know so you, 
you know, we, we work on making that value as negative as possible. The more negative that number is, the stronger the reductant after excitation. Um, it's not necessarily the case that more negative is always better. Um, you can sometimes, you know, you, you, there's sort of diminishing returns at some level, depending on what substrates you're using. Um, and also, um, there's this, you know, the Marcus theory kind of dictates the rates of electron transfer as a function of the thermodynamics. So, and, and you can sometimes get into what's called the Marcus inverted region, where actually increasing the driving force for electron transfer makes it slower. It's kind of a counterintuitive outcome of the Marcus theory, but it's well known. We haven't gone far enough to see that yet in the types of systems we're looking at, but it is a possibility. Um, so it's not always that more negative is better, but again, if you're trying to target substrates where there's a sort of a thermodynamic limit and, and you know, the existing photosensitizers are not strong enough reductants to to access them or, or are barely strong enough, when you increase that, you know, when you make that potential more negative, you can start to make that electron transfer become thermodynamically favorable, or even if it already is thermodynamically favorable, that little boost in driving force can often lead to significant increase in the rate of that electron mm. transfer. You know, something we think about a little bit, maybe not as much as we should, is sort of the, you know, the quantum yield of a photoredox transformation. That's kind of an also another area that people are starting to talk about a little bit more because, you know, synthetic organic groups, they just, you know, they blast their, their system with light as long as it takes and then they you know whatever it takes to get that really high you know yield of product and that's that's what they're happy yeah, with yeah. but th you know there, there should be i think some thought at least to the the photon economy you know like how many photons are you putting in to get that many molecules of product out and, and what's the efficiency of that with respect to photons you know photons are mm -hmm. cheap but they're not free um and you know so we if you if you want to you know improve the the if, the quantum efficiency, you know, the, the percentage of times that your excited state is able to transfer an electron to your substrate, improving the driving force basically improves that as well. So yeah. from, a, from the standpoint of photon efficiency, it's, it can be important also. That, yeah, that's definitely a really interesting perspective too. Cause I, I, even in our group, like we've just tried reactions where we just leave a light on overnight. So it's like, I, mean, I that's wonder. That's how it's done from a methodological standpoint. But yeah, if you, yeah. you know, some of these photo reactions, I mean, if you, there's, there's, we don't, we've only done it a couple times, to be honest. I'm not going to claim like we're that deep in this ourselves, but there is, there are some groups around the world that are, you know, particularly involved in trying to quantify quantum yields for photoreos transformations. And, and some mm. of them are shockingly low, you know, because it's, it's, again, it's an issue that most people don't think about. Um, but it, you know, from a practical standpoint, if you can get the quantum yield higher, there are, there are reasons to want to do that. Maybe we should explain quantum yield real quick because I know – I think it's basically like how many how many photons or not, – not photons, but per like light, how many photons you could emit like or something like that. Well, so there's, uh, there's, different, there's different types of quantum yields depending on what you're, what you're looking at. So the denominator is typically always going to be the number of photons absorbed by the system. Mm. The, the numerator is, you know, what process are you interested in happening after? So a photoluminescence quantum yield would be the number of emitted photons, the number of absorbed photons. That's kind of the one that most people are familiar with. It's a, okay. you know, when we, when we talk about the efficiency of luminescence, that's sort of what we're referring to. In, you know, photochemistry or photoredox chemistry, more specifically, you can measure quantum yields, which are basically, you know, how many molecules of product form over how many photons are absorbed. So, you know, ideally for a one photon, one electron transformation, every time you absorb a photon, you could transfer an electron, you could get 100% quantum yield if it was, you know, perfectly optimized. But in reality, that doesn't happen because there's other competing pathways besides just the electron transfer, you know, the inherent excited decay, there's possible side reactions and things you have to worry about sometimes too. So the quantum yield basically is, you know, moles of product over moles of photons that are absorbed. Mm and um for photochemistry so a lot, of, a lot of my graduate work that we talked about earlier was measuring the quantum yields for halogen elimination you know which is basically you know how many how many moles of product are are formed for how many moles of photons we put in yeah and, and you know, think now that i think about it now like it would be the, the merits of the goal work if you could make things if you could make uh, these uh, compounds like more um efficient I mean, I wonder how much like electricity you'd save in like in these. I, I haven't read those papers. I haven't, I haven't read those papers close. They haven't read those papers closely. There are there has been again the groups that are doing that are kind of making this push for, you know, thinking about the quantum yield more than we do have have kind of done some analysis on, you know, the the benefits, the cost benefits, especially of 
of optimizing that and thinking about that. Um, there's there's kind of a you know there's an adage in the field that you know oh photons are cheap, but sure I'm sure when you get to industrial scale things where you know every cost input matters, um, you know the the amount of power you're using and the the amount of light that you're using would be potentially significant factors. Yeah, I'd be I'd be I I would actually be curious to see you know the analysis on that like what what actually does cost. I, I'd be curious now. There is but, a paper that came out recently called "The Cost of Quantum Yield," I think, which is mm, okay. perspective. I think I think the author was uh, John Swerk. He's a um, assistant professor at Binghamton. who's kind of you know one of, one of the emerging leaders in in sort of studying quantum yields of these transformations and mechanisms in general. Um, and and he's written one or two articles where that that kind of topic is discussed. I'll but check it out. Them, I have to admit I'll that I haven't read them closely myself, but I'm certainly interested in the topic. I'll definitely read the abstract and conclusion. See if. Uh... <laughs> at least yeah. and see, right? <laughs> usually, usually all I have time for these days. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but anyway, Professor Teets, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. It's such a pleasure sure. talking with you. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, if we get some grad students, check out Professor Teets, be on the lookout for new publications and on the, the phosphorescence and photoluminescence and photoredox catalysis. All right. Thank fields. you so much, Aiden. It was great right. to be here. Yeah.